My name is Marcus Warner, and I write music for a living. Music that is often labelled as epic, but essentially is just like film soundtracks, only without the film. I do like to make films, however, and I like to make tutorials and behind the scenes type stuff. I've just found that as the years have gone past, I've had less and less time to do so, which is where Patreon comes in, because not only can this be like a little dedicated space where I can upload more regularly and be myself, if I have but one patron, <laughs> then that will be justification for me to pull out these cameras and make something once per month. And what is it I'm going to be making? Well, I'll start by telling you what I'm not going to be making, and that's a guide on how to succeed in the music industry, or for that matter, how to write good music. Everything that I couldn't teach myself about making music, I was able to learn through YouTube or on a forum. And to be honest, if you just copy what I do in these videos and nothing else, all you're going to get out of this is a masterclass on how to sound like Marcus Warner. The problem with that <laughs> is that Marcus Warner already exists. Hello. And so you'd be pretty much setting yourself up for failure immediately. What these videos are about is having fun in the studio, discussing things and improving together, and it's going to be a bit more unscripted and off the cuff than this. There is going to be bad language, there are going to be some pretty cringy memes, and you may pick up the occasional tip or new technique, but more importantly, I hope that when you finish one of my videos you'll come out of it feeling refreshed and inspired to write more music, because at the end of the day, that is what this is all about. And on that note, I'm going to start this series and this free preview on Patreon by talking about the most superficial level of my music making and also the question that I get asked most often, and that is, what virtual instruments do I use? <laughs> And I figured rather than just talk at you for 30 minutes or an hour, as it would turn out, I'd make this more interesting by organising them into a tier list. That's right, I see these all the time on YouTube and I've been dying to make my own. Well, my time has come. <laughs> this may never happen again, so I hope you enjoy and let's get into it. I'm going to be rating them not just on how good they sound and the value for money, but also on how useful they've been and how much longevity they have. I'm also going to be ranking them on like their presentation, on how nice they are to use, uh, plus any personal thoughts, stories or anything like that to go with it. And I've arranged them all in alphabetical order by company. So we're starting off with 8DO. <laughs> oh boy. First up, their 1928 Steinway scoring piano. Legacy edition, no less. They've updated it quite a bit, I think, since I downloaded this. And it's now available for free uh, on part of their sale. I'm not entirely sure how it works. Thing is with library companies like 8DO and Spitfire, it's like, if you buy it full price, you've made a mistake. Don't buy it full price. They're always on sale at some point. You know, it's not even just a question of it being on sale or not. It's like, how much of a sale is it going to be? I've had some libraries that have been 20% off and then later on in the year, they're 40% off for some reason. So yeah, don't ever buy a library full price. I don't know whether it's just going to be free and they've put this ridiculous discount on it. I never paid that much for it. I've had this a very long time and you'll probably recognize the sound of it. I've used it a lot over the years, but not so much recently. Yeah, I left the pedal on for a bit long there, didn't I? It's been a solid companion over the years, but it has been probably a good four or five years since I actually used it in anything. It's just a bit bright for my taste. And what I used to do with this was I would layer it up with Spitfire Labs felt piano just to give that a bit more dynamic range. And before that, what I used to do was I'd probably put an EQ on it that kind of looked like this. <laughs> 
Pretty darn good, and if it's free, I mean, you can't really complain about that. You know, the mic controls and everything, it definitely gets an A tier. And uh, there we go, our first rating. <laughs> We're off to a positive start. Well done, 8 Dio. Next up, 8 Dio ta Tacos? 8 Dio Taiko Ensemble. Ooh. Bring that volume down a little bit. Yeah, this is fantastic, honestly. I've got no complaints about this Taiko Ensemble at all. Sounds marvellous. Sometimes it's a bit hard to mix, like I'll find that the uh, low end is a bit rumbly and have to low cut it, but I've got the price here written as $38 on sale, and it might be a bit more than that, usually. You know, like I said, don't buy it if it's not on sale. <laughs> and yeah, I'm on the master patch right now, but it's got a whole bunch of different ensemble sizes. I've also got shapes and sticks and stuff. Um, yeah, it's really solid. You're going here. Now for the third and final library that I have from 8DO, and uh, this has been a staple of mine for a very long time. Ooh. Bring that stereo output down a little bit. We're clipping the stereo output even though we've got nothing else going on. 8DO Epic Toms. Instantly recognizable as 8DO Epic Toms and probably found their way into 99% mm, of the tracks that I've written throughout my career. Obviously not the most complicated interface you've ever seen. Uh, the mod wheel does sort of make it a bit snappier. I think it just cuts away at the end of the sample. Just kind of useful from time to time. I don't get a whole lot of joy to use them, but in terms of function, it cannot be denied that pretty much the entire first eight, nine, maybe 10 years of my career have been built on using these in pretty much every piece of music. Eight Dio Epic Toms, you get to go in S tier. Our next manufacturer is Embertone. And if you haven't heard of Embertone, you'd be forgiven because I don't think anybody's heard of Embertone. I have a few Embertone libraries, and in alphabetical order, the first is the cello. Embertone Blakus Cello. Uh, it's great, not gonna lie, all of their libraries are great. This one is $99, and to be fair, come to think of it, I don't know if I've ever seen this one on sale, but I bought this and the violin in 2014. So they've been with me 10 years, and yeah, it doesn't sound particularly great when you just play it, but I have to say, I absolutely love the amount of control and key switches you get with their instruments. They have all of these different playing techniques, sure, but I also love the fact that with this key switcher here, the slur, Rather than getting a bow change, you hold down C sharp zero and you get. And usually, um, same with their other libraries, I'll probably add a bit of high end to this. Take some of that down. It gets an S tier. Um, is it better than the toms? Yeah, it's pretty darn good. If you can't afford a cello player, I mean, I've got a Spitfire solo cello as well. And whilst that sounds really good as well, the Ember Tone stuff is definitely more soloist. And my thoughts are pretty similar when it comes to their solo violin, the Friedlander. Ember Tone instruments are a little bit quirky. Like, I have this control set up to control the vibrato, but... It's not doing anything. I need to right click and I need to learn CC automation, do this again, and now, hopefully. Yeah, we're there. This is what happens when an instrument is a decade old and hasn't been updated once. But, again, as far as sound goes,
knew it. They've also got a different key switcher to the cello, so I was fiddling around here for a second trying to press this C and not getting any result. I've really rediscovered these instruments recently with this key switcher, and it's been a really useful tool to have uh, writing this new album. So again, Ember Tone, you've outdone yourself. I actually like this more than the cello. I'm starting to think actually, I'm being, I'm being a little bit too generous because that is the first library out of these where I think, yes, definitely S tier. I think I'm gonna bring the toms down to an A. They're a high A, same with the cello, and then the Steinway can be a B just because even though it's free, I would not bother downloading it now, and we'll get into why in a minute. Yeah, okay, I think that's probably a slightly more accurate representation of where we are so now. And this Friedlander violin, this gets to be our first S tier, after all. I'm really sorry that I'm a bit bad at this. Uh, next up, oh boy, are we in for a treat now. Well, prizes to the best interface ever invented. I bought this in like 2015 and back at that point there was very little in the way of world music instruments. And I think oh, the only other way to get an Airhu VST was to buy like a full east-west library that had all sorts of different world instruments in it and it probably wasn't that good if I remember rightly. This was $80 and for that you just got a really nice sounding instrument. I do think with this one, I've never liked it without a little bit of extra high end. It really does sound like it was recorded on an SM57 or something. Sounds pretty good. I've got a bit too much reverb on there. Apologies for that. This library doesn't have the slur key switch, which I was really disappointed in because I do feel like for doing little It's a little bit awkward sounding. It's sort of like the bit the player's going, why am I doing this? This is not how an air who is played. The player's kind of going like, Doo -doo -doo, like that. And air who playing is meant to be quite a sort of slow and quite, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Flowing type of activity. It's not meant to be like a, Doo -doo -doo -doo. I mean, there is like fast, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about, Never mind. And again, all these configurations, we can change how fast the portamento is. Let me turn it all the way down. Pretty cool. Bow noise intonation. This instrument is great. For $80, I mean, this has been one of my favorites over the years. Um, do I use it very often? No. Do I just want to sit and play around with it for hours? Also no. This gets a very well-deserved A, um, but it can't be any higher than the cello, that's for sure. And uh, now, <laughs> moving on. I think Embertone is literally, or was literally just like two dudes doing this more for a hobby than anything. You know, the GUI was never the main focus. And uh, I have got to love that, um, is that Futura, that font? Anyway, this instrument, this virtual instrument, this virtual instrument, this virtual instrument is the reason that I learned how to play the Irish whistle. Coming down a little bit from that high, this is my final library from Embertone. Uh, again, $20, cheap and cheerful. Oh, vibrato is what, okay, let's make that CC21. 
Okay, so we do have vibrato control, that's good. Uh, you know, it's a very interesting thing in this day and age because it is sort of a little bit of cultural appropriation. What is appropriate for a composer to write and not write based on the culture that they come from and the culture that they're trying to represent in their music? Maybe a discussion for another time. Anyway, this uh, instrument with its snake GUI <laughs> uh, is great, but unfortunately for my purposes in the again, nine to 10 years that I've owned it. Pretty much next to useless for my music. So uh, unfortunately, this has got to go right down in in a D, but it's a, it's a high D. Okay, moving on now to our next manufacturer. It was inevitable that they would find their way onto a video at some point, but East West with their Hollywood brass and Hollywood strings were essential to the first album that I released as Marcus Warner. And before that, I was using a library, which unfortunately I can't even demo to you anymore because it works off of a CD and I cannot find it for the life of me. I was using Garatan Personal Orchestra for the first sort of year or two. And then when I decided that I was gonna release a proper album under my actual name, that was when I bought this. And here we are 11 years later and I'm still using it. And I'm still using it, not just like every so often, no, Pretty much every project, but here's why. These are just, yeah. This library is 10 years old. And yes, they've updated the interface a little bit since I bought it. The only slight caveat with this is that whilst I was able to buy Hollywood Brass and Hollywood String separately, it's now all just in a bundle or as part of their Composer Cloud, which to be honest, I don't know very much about, though I no longer have any receipts from as far back as then. I'm fairly certain that I paid like maybe 300 pounds for Hollywood Brass and Hollywood Strings together, which, at the time, for me, was an insane amount of money. <laughs> like, I had worked in the pub for maybe like a year to save up for that, or like half a year, I think, to save up and, and buy these two libraries. So for me, it was a huge investment. And was it worth it? Absolutely, every penny. <laughs> I also really do love to use the shorts. More recently, I've found that they're actually really great to use. It's this one here, which you control with the mod wheel. It's a little bit kind of like bitier and I love it, especially as I've been writing a bit more kind of fast horn passages recently, which I'm excited to share with you all. I wasn't planning to go too much into depth on this because you could talk about this for a while, but the uh, trombones are also pretty darn good as well. For me, this is well worth the money. And if you're getting the whole orchestra for about what I paid for just two sections back in the day, this is another S tier instrument. And in fact, I think it would even be, I'd rate it higher than the violin. I love it. However, Hollywood strings uh, started off pretty similarly. I used them as part of my main sound for the first four or five years of writing up until about 2018. Uh, this is the first violin section. They do sound decent, Hollywood strings, but I do feel that they were starting to show their age a little around the time that I was writing the Frozen Bite soundtrack, and especially on the staccatos. Again, pretty good sounding, but not quite on the same level as the brass for whatever reason. It's, it's kind of difficult to describe, honestly, but it stood out to me. Whilst the brass still sounded perfectly believable, I found that I wasn't being quite as convinced by the strings, which is when I actually upgraded um, to another library, which I'll talk about shortly. It's good, but would I recommend getting it? 
if it was on its own still? Probably not. That as it's part of the Opus edition anyway, or as part of Composer Cloud, can't really complain. And um, it's good, but it really just doesn't, to me, it's, I don't ever use it anymore. And so as a result, I can't give it any higher than a C. And uh, there it is, our first C. <laughs> it's a C plus, I think, but it's definitely still a C. Moving on to a way more recent addition to my collection. Collection, what the fuck am I, General Grievous? This is by Fracture Sounds, and Fracture Sounds are a company that I have now been working for for about a year. So I can't really talk about all of their libraries because I haven't paid for any of them and I'm pretty biased as a result. Um, but I figured I would talk about just two of them because these two in particular, if I didn't already have them, I would certainly buy them. And the first of these is the Spotlight Piano, which is their sort of signature grand piano for scoring. It is... Gorgeous. A real triumph of a library this is, and for a very young company as well. Um, so. Yeah, if you want to learn more about it, I have actually done a bit of a video walkthrough talking about all of their piano libraries, and I do actually like a demo track and stuff for this, um, but it's really good. I might not necessarily reach for it every time, however, and I'll get into why shortly, but the sound is superb. I don't think you can get a better sound out of a piano virtual instrument, so uh, this is an A. I think I'm going to have to bring this up past the epic toms. And yeah, I think this is going to be my number one A uh, for the time being. It is a really, really good instrument. And if you are looking to buy your first piano VST, I would definitely recommend this as your first. I wasn't really planning to talk about this, but this is something that has completely changed my work over the past uh, half year or so. Their other library that I absolutely adore. <laughs> yeah, this is amazing, and this is the reason that I'm not using epic toms anymore. These don't have to sound epic. You can sculpt the sound so much to your liking, and again, if you go to the Fracture Sounds YouTube channel, I've done a full video walkthrough that's like 20, 30 minutes long, talking about all the features of this. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm ever going to be looking back, to be honest. 8DO epic toms have kind of had their day, and so... <sighs> Yeah, I can't remove them from A because they have served me so well over the years, but unfortunately they are going to be going up here and they're going to be going past all of these guys to sit probably just under the cello, to be honest. So I said that I don't always necessarily reach for Spotlight Piano and this is why, because this is my piano. <laughs> So yeah, of course, the first thing to address is that the real thing is sitting over there right behind me. And um, it is my pride and joy. It was restored for me by All Instruments in Westbury in uh, 2021, and they just did all of the internals. Um, I've got a full video on it, of course, if you want to see it, and about how I made this sample instrument. The thing that makes it so useful for me is that, of course, if I don't necessarily want to set up the mics, I just want to play something in, and I might want to change it later, it's great that I can just put this in temporarily, and then whenever I'm ready, I can record the real thing in. It is also free. So um, if you'd like to download it, you can find it on my website. Um, is the interface that great though? I suppose probably not. Um, sound is decent. Sometimes it is a little bit like, it's not quite as punchy as the real thing, weirdly. It's so strange how like sampling an instrument can change its characteristics. I give it, um, yeah, I give it a solid B. Native Instruments Massive.
I'm a huge fan of Porter Robinson and a few years ago I bought this basically because I wanted to emulate that sound from language. I followed a tutorial on YouTube and that tutorial has made this preset, which I have had now for <laughs> however long it might be. More recently, I've started to play around with some of the presets a bit more and I figure out a little bit more how it works, but it does have a whole ton of stuff that I don't fully understand, honestly. But yeah, I've made my own sort of little preset here, which kind of is a bit more harmonic sounding and meant to emulate the sound of bagpipes to go with the new album. And I'm pretty happy with it. It's kind of a bit like contact. It's one of those industry standard type things. Again, don't ever buy it full price because native instruments are always doing some kind of sale. It does go into a lot of pieces of music. Is it essential? It doesn't do anything that Logic's inbuilt ES2 synth can do. It just makes it a little bit easier to make a fat sounding synth. It isn't really much higher than a C. And to be frank with you, I probably would even keep it below Hollywood strings just because Hollywood strings was for a time indispensable. All right, so uh, moving on now to the largest section of this video, because now we are going to be talking about Spitfire. <laughs> Full disclosure here, I've kind of been a bit of a fanboy of Spitfire in the past. I think a lot of people have been, to be fair. But they, they're they a very interesting company to me because they've made a lot of incredible libraries. And they've also made a lot of libraries that, in my opinion, go on image versus actual sound and usability. And this one is the most recent library that I bought from them. And unless they do anything groundbreaking soon, it's probably going to be the last because they just keep putting out new string libraries that are the best legato they've ever done, groundbreaking, and we've gone more overboard recording more things than ever before, etc., etc., etc. I mean, they've got their presentation down to a a T. <laughs> I was thinking of P. I was like, they got a presentation down to a P. <laughs> In some ways, I kind of miss back when they were a little bit more sort of smaller and, and it's this typical hipster talk. This It's like, oh, they were so much better before. But I do feel like over the years, they've become a bit more corporate and a little bit more like, you know, as any company gets bigger, the focus about making money becomes a bit more of a concern when you've got like 100 employees to pay versus, you know, 10. This is the most recent time that I felt a little bit shortchanged by a library. The first thing I do want to say about it, though, is that it is by far the most beautiful library I own. And like, I absolutely love this interface. It is always a bit fucking big, though. Like, let me make it a bit smaller. To use, it's quite nice as well. I will say there are certain things I don't like. Like, if I go here and change the mic mix, it sort of does this... Uh, like, it freezes there as it turns that one on and then turns this first one off for me um, because it's a mix. And it's like, it's fine, but I just wish it was a bit smoother. And um, it's kind of one of those things that's like, it's version 1.0.0, and I know it's never going to get updated now because they've moved on to the next thing. The sound is also... Certain keys and certain transitions sound a bit off at times. And the thing was, when it was presented uh, for the first time, you know, it was Paul Thompson's library and he spoke about how this is legato, like we've got this whole new technique for doing it and it's groundbreaking. And also we haven't programmed in vibrato control because we feel like dynamics and vibrato are intrinsically linked. And it's like, yeah, but sometimes I do want to play a loud non-vibrato note, you know? Because it is a legato library, it doesn't have any staccatos, really. It has this thing called glancing attack, but I just never reach for that. Great sound, but certain usability things that just really, really stump it for me. It's kind of a C minus. It would be a D if it didn't look so darn good. And that kind of vibe is going to continue... <laughs> 
for a lot of this section, I think. Um, so do brace yourself if you really love Spitfire. And talking of, uh, this library I got because I bought enough on Black Friday one year that I was able to get it for free. It's like this sort of gimmicky thing where if you bring the mod wheel down, it sort of closes up the orchestra. And then you bring the mod wheel up. And if you were doing like a bit of trailer music and you just wanted to crank out some stings really quickly, it'd be quite good for that. I have not used it once. It's a D. So next up, a completely different story here. We have Spitfire Chamber Strings. For the longest time, I was quite comfortable saying to people that if they wanted their first string library, they should get this. Because this is chamber strings, so it's a very small ensemble, but with a little bit of extra reverb and moving the mics around, you can get a pretty versatile sound out of it. This is also one of the few string libraries that I own that actually has an ensemble patch for just mucking around, so that's really useful. Uh, it has this beautiful flautando sound which has been raved about previously. If you recognise what piece of music that was, don't tell anybody. Really gorgeous legato as well. And the only reason really I haven't used it so much is because I bought a Passionata sort of thinking it was going to blow my mind, and it didn't. And ever since then, I've been sort of using a Passionata more to justify the purchase. So to be honest with you, I probably would still be perfectly happy using this if I hadn't bought a Passionata. So that's worth bearing in mind. However, the one thing I really wanted to say, and the other thing that kind of annoys me a bit about Spitfire is that, again, this hasn't been updated in at least six years. And I know this because the legato cellos have got this annoying click in one of the samples. I can't remember what transition it is, but this click that I've been hoping will be fixed <laughs> since 2018 and still hasn't yet. Yet despite this, the prices have gone up. And I know we're getting a bit like we're gonna be moaning about the current political climate and stuff. I don't mean to do that, but it is worth mentioning. When I bought this, it RRP'd for £457.50. And I got, a, to be fair, I think they still do this. I got a really good student discount, which took it down. And so my grand total for this library was £329.40. So as you can imagine, you know, we've, we've moved forward four years from when I bought Hollywood strings, and this cost more than the strings and the brass combined. So yeah, a bit more of an investment, but really paid itself off. Now, the RRP on this library is 650 and I have no idea why it's gone up so much. And we're going to see this kind of continue this theme a little bit. Hello, it's the editor here. So if you were paying attention just now, you may have noticed that I did not know how to read an invoice correctly. The £457.50 that I pointed out on screen was actually before value-added tax, which in the UK is 20%. And the tax that I show on screen here on the right is after the student discount has already been applied. So to compare that final amount with the standard price as shown on the invoice was a little bit disingenuous of me. To get what the actual RRP was, all we need to do is times that standard price by 1.2, which accounts for that extra 20%. And in the case of Spitfire Chamber Strings, the RRP in 2018 was actually £549. That isn't as drastic an increase as I thought, but on what is essentially a downloadable file that hasn't changed much, if at all, in the past six years, I still think it's a little bit of a rip-off. And I'll tell you what else I've discovered today. The student discount has changed too. So if we do a little bit of maths, looking at how much I saved here, it turns out that the educational discount at the time was 40%. Now, it is only 30%. So if we account for both that 
and the new hire RRP, the least you can expect to pay for this library with the discount is £454.30 as opposed to £329 that I paid in 2018. And the Valentine's Day sale that I actually had on screen there was more of a discount. It was like 35% or so. So I don't know if I can recommend it quite as highly as I used to be able to. But, you know, if you're currently working a sort of day job and you're saving up and really you're, you're convinced you want to get more into writing orchestral music and you're sure, <laughs> yeah, I would still recommend it. But that price, it sounds fantastic, um, but it's fucking expensive. So it gets... It gets a B. Uh, give it a B minus. No, I'll give it a B plus. Okay, well, tier list isn't going to let me do that, so we're going to have a just a just a B. <laughs> it's a, it's a B. Let's keep going. We've got a lot of Spitfire stuff to get through. So, uh, Spitfire's harp. I would not buy this at full price. I do not think it's one hundred and fifty pounds worth. It is, however, it's sort of ninety five, one hundred pounds worth. I held off buying this for quite a long time because there was only one thing that I specifically wanted out of it. And by God, do I not wish that I'd bought it sooner? Because whenever I wanted to do a glissandi using like Logic's inbuilt harp or whatever it was that I happened to be using, I would sort of do this. And if you're not a sort of seasoned, trained classical pianist, doing this really buggers your finger off after a while. So when I bought this, I was so excited because of the glissandi. <laughs> the only trouble is I can never remember how it flipping works. It's always like, press the key up here for a short one or press down there, but also move the vibrato and move the mod wheel and you get different speed controls. I think we've got the speed control here, but it's set to the wrong CC value. So I'm gonna change that. Gotta love the pentatonic though. This is like really nice. Ah, being transported to an island in the Mediterranean. Useful, gets used very often, especially on this new album. Doesn't blow my mind or anything. Do I like it as much as Massive? If I had to choose between Massive, ooh. Yeah, I'd put it, put it there, I think, actually. I think if someone was like, I'm gonna take away either a Passionata strings or the harp, I think I would actually, yeah, I'd put it there, C minus. So now jumping back in time to get turkeys off the menu. I bought this pretty much around the same time that I bought Chamber Strings as a sort of complimentary addition to it. And I will say for this library, kind of like with a Passionata strings, a lot of the sell for me was on the presentation and the sort of hype that they had around it. It was presented as being the tidal orchestra, which always sort of stood out to me as being quite romantic. Now I will say that I do like this library. It does have a load of lovely good patches in it. We've got sort of all these different, what are called swarms. And I'll just demo one now for you because not only do you have dynamics, but you also have variations. So. The trouble with it is, of course, is that now you've heard it, you'll probably recognise that every time you hear it, and I certainly do, and I always think to myself, oh God, is anybody going to notice? No one has, <laughs> at least not until now. Some other cool sounds as well. I do keep coming back to this library, and I think it's partly just because it does make me feel inspired. Like, it makes me feel quite kind of, like, proper. I remember when they put the marketing out for it, it was all about how at the time, Hans Zimmer had just finished writing Blue Planet 2, and this was kind of based on that sound. And yeah, I really loved that. I love that song that he did with Radiohead as well. So this kind of always reminds me of that. And so as a result, I won't be writing necessarily to sound like it, but I'll write sort of feeling that inspiration, which is quite valuable. But once again, in true Spitfire fashion, the price has gone up and it's now something like 199 um, but if you get it on sale, it's more like 129, which is closer to, I think, what I actually paid for it when it came out. I'll give it a B just because I do keep coming back to it and I probably will for years to come, um, which is more than I can say for Hollywood strings. So ladies and gentlemen, the very first Spitfire audio library that I purchased and the winner of the prize for largest percentage price increase from £245 when I bought it in 2018 to £349, so nearly a third more than it used to cost. A couple of years ago, they did an update, and then for some reason, my timpani wouldn't work in Contact 5 anymore. So all of my projects had to be updated to use Contact 7. That was fun. Joby Burgess Percussion. This is like something that I've been grateful for buying so many times. It's just your bog standard set of percussion for an orchestra, and it sounds great. 
Sorry, I don't use this master patch very often at all. I always use individuals, so I have no idea where anything is. Great key switches down here. He says, the default key switch position is C minus two. And it's like, why is it gonna be that far away? Like C zero will be fine. There's nothing down there. Key switches are now at C zero. Yeah, there's a couple of quirks. Like there's this variation control here. Up until this point, I'd had epic toms, epic tycos, and then Logic's inbuilt percussion. <laughs> This was my first sort of dedicated full percussion library. And yeah, I love it. Still gets used on every project. I love the triangles. I love the mark tree, stuff like that. It's just like really lovely to have it all be kind of easily accessible in a single library. Does it massively inspire me? No, it's definitely the most sort of utilitarian library that I own, but it's very good. And I think it does have to go up. Has to go up in A. I'd be very sort of hard pressed to work without it. So um, yeah, and to be honest, might just have to pip out Tom Factory simply because oh, we're nearly through the Spitfire stuff. Please bear with me. Now moving on to solo strings. I'm really sorry if anybody really loves the Lark Ascending. I, I know that I'm butchering it. This is a library that's really good if you're playing something that's a bit more kind of slow and kind of quartet-like, or if you want to layer it on top of a string section. And what I've found is that by using this with a Passionata, it kind of makes up for some of a Passionata's pitfalls. So if I've got a passage in my music where there's some faster runs going on, I found that I'll bring the volume of this library up a little bit and it doesn't sound like it's a ensemble library and a solo library stacked, it all kind of sounds like it's part of the same room. So it's really good for that. I have decided, and this is quite a recent decision, I have decided that I don't like using it for solos, except in certain situations. Most of the time, that Embertone library, with its you know key switches for slurs and stuff, is way better for like a solo, especially something more folky. But I think to be honest with you, the difference between those two libraries mostly comes down to personal preference. So if you like a slightly richer, more folky sound, go for Embertone. And if you like that more classical, sounds like it's in a hall, um, good for layering, this is great. I'm very happy that I have both. At times I'd find the solo strings a little bit frustrating to work with. I especially hate the fact that the tremolo is built into the vibrato control on the virtuoso violin and the cello. So it just means that you're trying to play something without any vibrato, which I do quite often. And so often this will happen, I'll be playing. And I'm like, I didn't mean to do that, you know, it happens all the time and I really wish I could turn it off. Is it as good as chamber strings? Nope. Is it as good as orchestral swarm? Yes. And it's probably going to beat the Steinway too, just because the Steinway is defunct. Whereas I don't know if this library will ever be defunct. I feel like we started off really positively and now this video is just descending into misery. Um, it's time to talk about Spitfire Studio Orchestra. Now I started by buying the Studio Brass for one reason only, and that was because I wanted the euphonium. And I wanted it for a specific project, a project which in the end didn't end up being published because the film got canceled. So I, I bought this library at full price and I'm incredibly embarrassed to tell you that full price, I think it was like 450 pounds. The other thing that I then did was that I got quite swayed at the following Black Friday and decided to then buy the rest of the studio orchestra the professional edition. This professional edition is decent and I think it is worth the price over the original because of the mic positions. So I've got here the solo trumpet. Do you hear it doesn't actually sound that good at times? So I'll try the different tree and I might try like the outriggers. This combination gives me a slightly more epic sound. One of the really big things that I love about this library that I didn't use originally is the multi-tongue techniques. Here we've got the trombones now. Decent. Oh, 
See, again, why Spitfire? The vibrato control by default controls the reverb. Why? Thankfully, I think I've saved a preset somewhere and makes the variation, which is what it should be, really, so that I can now get and they sound really good. Like I said, a few frustrations about it. I'll just show you how tree number two and the outriggers together, and then I'll crank up the inbuilt reverb. And this actually blends pretty well with Hollywood brass. It just, there are some things that Hollywood brass can't do, like the multi-tongue, but this kind of makes up for those shortfalls. It's very kind of biting and I, I do love the trumpet sound and in this most recent album I've definitely been using this a lot more. As for the rest of the studio orchestra however this is where I've got to really dock some points because I don't know what it is but so often when I'm playing around with Spitfire studio orchestra I just think it sounds a bit synthy. These flutes to me do not sound that convincing. It's when you play something fast especially. in the symphonic woodwinds. And in fact, to make it a fairer comparison, I'll bring it close mic That to me sounds really convincing. I, I, again, there's certain techniques included in the studio orchestra that the symphonic doesn't have. I don't think I even want to particularly show you the strings because you've got all these options. Let me just get violins 1, 16 up. Different size options, that's nice. You could have them play Davizi, but you know, compare that to the one from chamber strings. At £899 for the full orchestra, it is not cheap. And I think for that price, there are way better options. Spitfire Studio Orchestra, yeah. And I do really love the brass in it. But I really wish I had just bought the brass. Really, if I'd have got the symphonic brass, I'd have got all of those sort of techniques as well. Which kind of annoys me because now that I've bought all of these studio orchestra plugins, I'm not giving Spitfire money for the Symphonic as well. It just, it, I just can't morally justify that to myself, no matter how useful they might prove to be. I will make these work, but I wish I'd bought the Symphonic ones. So I just have the Symphonic woodwinds. And the reason is I bought those quite a long time ago. I think I bought them in 2018 as well when I was starting to write a little bit more variety. You know, woodwinds aren't always the first sort of port of call. I, I definitely think that I should have brought them into my music a bit sooner. You know, it's, it's really worth learning about sort of like doubling strings and, and using flutes to go with violins and stuff like that. Um, so yes, uh, Spitfire Symphonic Woodwinds do get rated quite highly. I was going to say they're reasonably priced, but I've just looked and I've written here that they cost, Jesus Christ, £549. I think they're going to have to go next to Chamber Strings for that. Fucking hell, Spitfire. On sale, they're 356 I'm going to bring this <laughs> under the solo, actually. They didn't cost that much originally. I'm sure I've got the original invoice, that, and they won't be anywhere near as much as that. Which brings me on nicely to Hans Zimmer Strings, because... For some bizarre reason, Hans Zimmer strings on sale is actually less than their introductory price back in 2018, which is quite impressive, you know. I've done a video all about it, and uh, I mostly do stand by my opinion back then, though I will say that I do like a lot of the textures. I've come to sort of love them over time. This library has had a new lease of life since I bought a Passionata because the shorts in this library help fill out um, the missing sections from a Passionata. If I'm feeling kind of quite techy and I want to really dive into all the settings and sort of play around with mics for an hour, I can get them to match pretty darn well. And I think this is a good time to compare them to Hollywood strings because it was this comparison that made me realise I was due an upgrade as far as strings was concerned. If I jump back to the Hollywood strings, which hopefully is still on staccato, and then you compare that to the Hans Zimmer strings. Now I know it's a bigger section, but still. There is a big, big difference there. That being said, <laughs> I still wish I'd just bought the symphonic strings. There's so much of this library that I don't use. And the one thing that is okay on a Passionata, but the one thing I really don't like about this library is this ridiculous drop down with no search or anything. It's like, sorry, let me just scroll down this list inside a list here. If I wanna, okay, let me find some effects. 
and uh, I want them to be cello and oh, not violin. Hang on. Okay, so yeah, there we go. We've got cluster slides, but we've only got them for 20 cellos on the right. We don't have 60 cellos doing that for whatever reason. And again, we're on version 1.4.6. They did quite a big update a couple of years back, I remember, but again, it's one of those libraries that just sort of sits. It does some really great pizzicato effects, like Bartok pizzicato. You might recognize that from one of my pieces. Uh, yeah, it's fine. It's expensive. Um, I've done a video on it. Would I buy it again? No, I would definitely buy Spitfire Symphonic Strings if I could go back in time. It's slightly better than the Charmer. Okay, nearly done with the Spitfire stuff. Starting to feel a bit worn out. <laughs> We're on to Spitfire Labs now, which is very nice. Um, I've started up, let me just get you the felt piano because I guarantee you that if you are not aware of this library's existence, you probably will have heard it somewhere. This is their free labs plugin, and if you haven't heard of it, it's definitely worth investigating because there's lots of nice instruments on there. One of the most recent ones that I have to say I really do like, the Yillian Pipes. This is a recent edition and sounds pretty darn good. They have stopped making them though, at least according to the forums and YouTube comments, uh, Spitfire haven't made any labs instruments in a while, but they do have a lot of stuff on here and it's free. As you heard, that felt piano, that was what I would layer with the 1928 Steinway um, to sort of make, you know, a bit more of a unique piano sound until I then got an actual piano. So very useful in that respect. Um, however, that felt piano is also used everywhere and is very recognizable. Can't really fault it for any of that. Um, you know, Spitfire Labs, it's great. I never play a Spitfire Labs instrument and sort of find I'm having tons and tons of fun though. So, uh, you yeah, know, it's an A minus, um, you yeah, know, better than mine. <laughs> now, just wrapping up the Spitfire bit with a couple of cheaper libraries from them. These ones cost 29 pounds and they are pretty simple. I have two of them. One is Drumline and I bought it pretty much just for these rolls. God's sake. Decent 30 quid spent. Uh, nothing massively exciting about it. So uh, I'll give it a uh, yeah, C minus. I think it's probably a good place to put that. This is another felt piano from Spitfire. They've got like four, I think. This one again, 29 pounds. So more than it was for the free one, of course, but it's slightly grittier sound, I think. Turn that volume. Jesus Christ, that's quiet. The thing that I don't particularly get about this library is it's aimed at sort of, you know, new young composers that don't have a whole lot of money. So it's £29 and for that you get three mic positions and a whole bunch of controls. If you're at the point in your career where like you're thinking to yourself, oh, you know, £29 is a bit of an investment. Thank goodness that Spitfire have made a library that's at this price. Honestly, I see no reason to buy this over just getting the free one. Because with the free one, like I did, you could just layer something else with it. Even like one of Logic's inbuilt pianos would sound good layered with that. The reason I think I bought this was actually for my video about sampling the Bluthner. And to be honest with you, I'll let you decide what you prefer. This goes right down here. We are now on to our final library company. And thank goodness, we are gonna finish off this video on a high note because we are going to be talking about Sound Iron Olympus. Uh, so, not too long after I had bought Hollywood Strings and Hollywood Brass, I realised that the other key ingredient to making epic orchestral music was a choir. And I researched for days, solidly spending hours on the internet trying to decide what to get. I think I was torn between this and something from 8DO. I am so glad that I went for this. This interface is like next level. We get three points for the interface, 10 out of 10 points for the sound. 
Hasn't been updated in 10 years, literally since I bought it. Not one thing has changed about this instrument, but that implies that something needs to. And uh, if you've been listening to my music for a while, this sound will be very familiar to you. It's a certified classic. The phrase builder is also stunning, um, but I will show that with the men's choir. The only trouble with Sound Eye and Olympus is that there is no small. It is only massive epic choir or else. So as I've got older and written a bit more variety and wanted to have like a smaller ensemble, at least the sound of a smaller ensemble, I found that it's actually easier just to record myself singing many times in different voices. And I certainly wouldn't write just like a choral choir only type piece using this library. It is not good for that. I can't remember how much I paid for it back in the day. Right now, the combination, both the women's and the men's choir is $549. Whether or not it'll go on sale, I can't entirely say for certain. So often with many of these library companies, I do think to myself, it's like, you know, when you're charging this much, it might be quite nice to keep it updated a little bit. I will say that Sound Eye and Get Away of It, just simply because it doesn't really need any more doing to it. But this interface is showing its age a bit. And actually that does lead me on nicely to the phrase builders. Firstly, let me just quickly chuck Venus. Venus goes well up into A. I'm gonna make it Ooh, yeah, it goes probably just, just over the percussion libraries and just underneath the cello. One thing that kind of annoys me a little bit is that they have all these sort of like weird controls that don't really do anything. Like, why would I want to not have these notes do something, you know? Like, I would much sooner that rather than playing here... That is not the correct D. That is a D, that is a D3, I think, and we are playing a D4. That should be an ah. And that's kind of annoying when you're writing for both sopranos and altos and tenor and bass, because you'll find that you're trying to look at the MIDI and they're all stacked on top of each other. But there's a lot of other controls that I do like speed and stuff. But if we go and have a look now at the phrase builder, and this is where the real sort of like epic side of this library comes out. We have these options here. Um, again, interface wins top marks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we've got these phrases and we can just stick a bunch of syllables in at random and then you have all these phrases, or however many phrases that is, like what, 16 phrases? We can use these key switches way up here at the top to go back if we wanted to reuse part of the phrase. And then down here at the bottom, we can now switch between phrases. Now, Venus loads up as standard with this. Hilariously, if I now go to, go to their third, uh, the key switches are different for the different instruments. That's also a real pain in the butt. So, um, yeah, third phrase here, this is just the default. And again, let me get up the correct note by using this top key switcher, which again is a different note. Okay. Now I can't say for certain, but I think that that is meant to say, will you sin for us women? Women? It's a pain in the ass to use this phrase builder, but that being said, I've now been using it for 10 years. I've been using it for 10 years. I still haven't got the hang of it completely. Um, and for a while I didn't use it because it really is like big and there is no way of sort of bringing it down in scale. You've got to be writing a big piece of music to use this. But for most of my work, I mean, that kind of applies. So Mars as well, um, both of them are gonna go way up here because let's face it, a lot of my sound as Marcus Warner has been in part due to those libraries. So. Yeah, there we go. I've said this many times in the past, um, and I said it in like how to make an orchestral album, but I definitely think if you're gonna start with a first sort of proper good sounding library, uh, make it the strings and then go for brass and then go for woodwinds and then finally percussion, because that's kind of the order in how uh, difficult it is to make it sound good. You know, strings kind of are the hardest and therefore should probably be your top priority. And I wish that I could still wholeheartedly recommend Spitfire Chamber Strings. The price though has just got kind of out of hand. Um, so yeah, definitely worth waiting around. They do sort of Christmas sales, they do Black Friday sales and such. 
Um, and I hope that, you know, that that will aid you in being able to buy it. Um, but there are definitely some other competitive options coming on the market now that I haven't used. And it's kind of sad that I can't really justify buying anymore because I do see that performance samples are doing some really interesting sounding stuff. Um, yeah, and a whole bunch of other things too that are just coming on. So general advice here is go for strings first. And I hope that seeing what I've used over the years will help you decide what to get or more likely what not to get. And if you see anybody online asking what virtual instruments I use, uh, please feel free to send them to this page. I still haven't fully set it up yet, so I don't know exactly what the tiers are gonna be. I know that there'll be one for watching the videos and then there'll be like another one for taking more of an active part in the discussion and voting on what videos you'd like me to make next. And I also hope to set it up so that people can submit their pieces of music to me for review and I can make videos hopefully talking about what I would improve and making something useful out of that as well. Uh, but it's all a bit up in the air as of filming, so please bear with me. I will probably have written it in the description below or to the left in the description or wherever the heck, <laughs> wherever it is that I'm supposed to write it. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for watching and I will see you when I see you. Goodbye.